Well, hello, everybody. It's me, Carmen Mazera, Executive Director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. We are so glad to welcome you to another webinar specifically for the advisors in our Public and International Service Advisor Network. PISA is here to be of service to you and to your students so that you can come to understand all of the many amazing possibilities in the fields of public and international affairs. Today, we are so glad to partner again with Women in International Trade and to have three amazing speakers to talk to you about the many different possibilities in that space for your students and the skills they might need to be successful and all of the different contributions they can make in that regard. We will also have a preview of the WIT scholarship that was open to your students and I'll let them give you much better information than me on that possibility for them but it's also a way for them to continue to develop their skills even while they're still in school. This session will be recorded and available on the APSIA YouTube page afterwards so you can revisit it and continue to, to learn from the wisdom we'll share with you here today. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to contact me or my colleague, Brittany Chor, and we'll be happy to take care of you in that way. And as we go through, if you have questions for our speakers, feel free to put those in the chat. So before I launch in and turn the floor over to our speakers, I wanna say thank you again to Wit and especially to Lisa for putting this panel together. And thank you to my team, especially Brittany, for all of the logistics and arrangements that make these kinds of opportunities possible. So thanks to our speakers, thanks to our attendees, and thanks to the staff at APSIA. Lisa, the floor is yours. Well, Carmen, thanks to you. Thanks to you and the team, especially Brittany, for helping us pull this together. and. Um, Thanks for having the kind of energy I really needed to get the afternoon going because now we're really excited. Um, not that we weren't to begin with, but we're really excited to partner up with APSIA again to really to have this conversation around what are the skills relevant to building a career in international trade? We know that's become a very popular field these days, especially with all the attention paid to trade policy over the last two administrations. Um, and I, what we've always seen as being really helpful about these skills sessions is that we can focus on the breadth and range of opportunities that really are part of the trade policy field. You know, I say that all the time in my job uh, covering trade policy for Dow Chemical. You know, this is an area where trade's both the issue that we work on, but very often the channel by which we get a lot of things done. Um, and there are so many ways to approach that, as you're going to hear from our two amazing speakers. And we'll have a third, Marjorie Chorlins, who will join us about midway through. Um, but we really wanted to focus and share the great experiences ladies have had and what have been those skills really relevant to helping them build a career. Um, I'm delighted, honored that Sherry and Maggie were willing, were able to join us for this afternoon, especially because they really represent not only great friends and longtime colleagues, um, but fellow members of Women in International Trade. So WIT DC is a local professional and personal networking association here in Washington. Um, we are a chapter under our broader global parent known as OWIT, the Organization of Women in International Trade. Um, OWIT itself has a wide range of chapters across the United States, several in Canada, and an international presence these days, including the OWIT president, who's actually based out of uh, Nairobi uh, in Kenya. So uh, as a chapter WIT DC, we are the largest uh, chapter under the organization. We have about 700 members here in Washington. And it exemplifies what we're talking about, the range of opportunities, everything from embassy members to congressional staff, U.S. government, corporate, NGOs, academic, journalists. And it really comes together, the heart, I feel like, of, of WIT is that we are a voluntary organization. Members come together and take responsibilities to put together programs, to run events, and even to manage the WIT Trust, which is the group that I currently represent, the trust being our charitable arm that actually runs the scholarship program. And I am going to put a link to the scholarship program in the chat so you have a chance to take a look at it and to share. And what I like, what I really appreciate about our scholarship program is um, we are not the kind of group that can finance tuitions these days. We know what these kind of programs go for. But it is a one time uh, each semester we do fall set and a, a spring set. Um, and basically the scholarship, it's, it's really kind of an essay contest where um, young women 
uh, graduate, undergraduate level, um, at the undergraduate level, junior and senior, as well as graduate level programs, um, can submit a paper on a relevant trade topic. Five to 10 pages can be papers they worked on in class. We really wanted to make it uh, very user friendly. But what's great about the program is that it gives them the chance to apply. The scholarship stipend is a $1,500 check. But I think what's become much more beneficial part of the program is engagement with WIT. So we do bring these young women in as members. We create a, a mentor relationship for them. And the really fun part, much like we're doing right now, is we build a program around the topic of their essay and have a very similar panel virtual discussion. We're doing these virtually because oftentimes our students uh, aren't necessarily from the DMV area. Our current scholarship winner, for example, is at Columbia up in New York. And we'll be doing a panel on her trade and gender diversity paper coming up soon. So you can keep you can sign up for the newsletter on the website too and keep an abreast of the programs that are coming through. Um, but we really wanted to have a chance, as I said, we're going to dive into the skills component of, of our workshop today and feel free to keep sending in both your comments and questions over the chat. Um, I'm thrilled that we're joined today both by Sherry and Maggie uh, because they truly do exemplify not only great women in town who are very candid and, and happy about giving back to our community, but they really represent the range of opportunities that exist in trade. Um, Ch Sherry, for example, um, I've known her since her days in the Commerce Department, where we've done a lot of work together on Asia Pacific, um, but uh, where she's had the opportunity to be a desk officer, run teams, focus on market access, advising companies. And that's a role that really helped her obviously transition to her current role um, as the Senior Director for Strategy and Global Affairs at the American Chemistry Council, one of our industry's premier trade associations here in D.C. Um, we also have Maggie Spicer, who Maggie, I know, will be giving a really interesting background, um, especially as she can talk to the opportunities that exist to take the um, her areas of expertise in trade that built up working as a lawyer at White and Case, um, one of D.C.'s greatest law firms, but to transition to that into her own consultancy, opening up her own shop um, and creating the opportunity to really engage with clients much more directly, particularly in a way of driving sustainable development opportunities here and around the world. So without further ado, as both these ladies can tell their story far better than I can, Sherry, why don't I turn to you to, to kick us off? Okay. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thanks to Carmen and AP, APSIA for inviting us to join you today. Um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I graduated from George Washington University here in, in D.C. with an MBA in international business, and I thought that I was headed for corporate America. Um, I still have yet to get there, um, so my, my plan uh, was, was a bit diverted. I actually began my career in trade at the U.S. Department of Commerce in the International Trade Administration. And I spent about 20 years there doing a whole uh, variety of different, different uh, positions and now at the American Chemistry Council. So I'd like to start with um, my work at, at uh, the Commerce Department, tell you a little bit about the different roles I had, and then uh, particularly, I understand you're interested in what skills are, are really most valuable. So I'll talk about that as well. So when I started at the International Trade Administration, I was doing trade enforcement. And in, in that space, we are really looking at um, complaints by U.S. companies of goods that are being unfairly sold here in the U.S., so basically being dumped at less than fair value. So I was, you know, brand new, and I was assigned to work on an investigation of unfairly sold products from Brazil, steel products. And so practically what that meant was that I spent a year of my life looking at uh, the sales in the U.S. market of two Brazilian steelmakers, going through their accounting records, really basically sort of peeling back the onion to figure out what their cost of manufacturing was and what their fair sales price should be here in the U.S. And this also entailed you know, actually going to Brazil, going to those companies and looking through their records, their, their, their information, doing what we call a verification to make sure that the 
back in those days, you know, we would get submissions in writing. So we would get boxes and boxes of information from them. So we had to verify their information. So a lot of analysis um, and, and travel to overseas markets, really fascinating work. So really looking to see whether the sales were unfairly sold here and whether there was actually domestic injury to U.S. manufacturers. I then moved to uh, trade promotion. And in this role, I actually moved out, I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is my home. And I worked at the Commerce Department's Export Assistance Center. And there what I did is I helped companies, either manufacturer or service providers uh, based in Western Pennsylvania, figure out where and how to sell their products and services. So here, this was really more of a consulting role. And so we would look at what the company was making, and we would really analyze their potential overseas markets and come up with a strategy for them in terms of where they should, uh, which markets they should enter, how they should do it. Should they find a local partner, distributor, et cetera? What should their pricing be? And what were the, what's the regulatory environment there? What, what laws and regulations do they have to worry about? And of course, importantly, who are their competitors, right? So really looking to help mainly small to medium-sized companies do business in overseas markets. And then I came back to Washington, back to the Commerce Department headquarters, and started in a role really looking to do trade policy. And so here, my role, um, and this is where Lisa and I started working together, um, looking at the business environment in overseas markets. Uh, and as Lisa mentioned, I, I spent a lot of time working on Europe, um, Central and Southeast Europe, Turkey, and then I pivoted to Asia and I focused on uh, Southeast Asia. And so I had teams uh, in, in both of those roles looking at the countries uh, and, and their business environment. How easy or difficult is it for U.S. companies to do business there? And what we tried to do was really enhance intellectual property protection and remove market access barriers so that U.S. companies could actually compete successfully in those countries. So we looked at things like customs procedures, were they burdensome, were too many testing requirements, were U.S. companies treated differently from domestic producers or from competitors from third markets? Um, looked at things like what were the intellectual property protections, uh, say for pharmaceutical companies looking to introduce new products into the market. And so here, um, my role was, was not only looking at trade policy versus the promotion or enforcement, but the work that I did was a bit different here. Um, you know, my my client, if you will, was different in that I was working really more with larger companies. So bigger multinational companies who have government affairs teams like Lisa here in Washington, D.C., um, doing a lot of writing, writing briefing papers for senior department, senior commerce department officials, and then briefing those officials. So the undersecretary for international trade, the secretary of commerce. Um, and also traveling with those officials to, to these markets in many cases. Um, and we worked a lot with the fo folks from the foreign embassies here in Washington. So if I'm covering Turkey, I would deal a lot with the folks from the Turkish uh, embassy. Um, so lots of opportunities uh, in the public sector, had a lot of different roles, found them all very rewarding and interesting. Um, then three years ago, I actually pivoted to the private sector. Um, and so as, as was mentioned earlier, I'm now with the American Chemistry Council um, doing global affairs. Um, so my role is, is not um, as, it's not limited to, to trade, if you will. It, it encompasses trade and, and a little bit broader. Um, so here what I do, we are a member of the International Council of Chemical Associations. And within that, that um, organization, I manage 64 chemical associations around the world. So we've got a network of ACCs around the world. And I'm really more doing a bit of international development. So what we're doing is we're trying to help them enhance their ability, their, their member company's ability to um, protect the environment, make ensure their workers' health and safety, right, when they're making these chemicals. And so I'm, uh, my, my work is in the development space a bit as we do a lot of capacity building to try to bring those associations uh, members up to the level that we have here in the United States or, or some other developing countries. 
Um, and in this role, not only do I work with uh, overseas counterparts in the private sector a lot, I also deal a lot with multilateral stakeholders. So uh, first and foremost being the United Nations, the UN Environment Program in particular, right? We have a lot of, um, I would say, mutual priorities in enhancing the safe management of chemicals. And we do a lot in the regulatory space, right? Looking at how chemicals are managed in, in various countries around the world and trying to ensure that there are regulatory frameworks in place uh, that, that ensure that those chemicals are, are managed safely. Um, and so in all of these roles, uh, you know, giving it a little thought, I think there's probably three skills that I would say are really important. And of course, this would build on the, the education, the classwork that your students are all taking, whether they're interested in a particular region of the world or a particular aspect of, of international business or trade. Um, the first, I would say, analytical skills, right? I've had to do analysis of one type or another in every role that I've had. Um, I've had to train junior staff on analytical skills, things like, you know, we're analyzing trade data, sales data, analyzing foreign markets, the U.S. market, uh, competition, right? We're, we were always at ITA looking at trade investment um, uh, statistics and, and analyzing uh, trends, right? What what would be hap what we could uh, possibly predict happening in the future? Um, and now in my role at ACC, I would say analysis is even more important, and and it's big data that we're analyzing, right? We're trying to gather and analyze data from the global chemical industry. So, data analytics is super important, and even more so now than when I started way back when. Um, I'd also say communication skills are really important. Um, the ability to, um, you know, share your your information, your knowledge, either in briefing papers uh, or, you know, in 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 person, verbally, critically important. Um, and I would I would say that listening um, is is a really important part of that. Listening to the feedback that the Secretary of Commerce is giving you when you're briefing him or her, the questions that they're asking you, and being able to respond and react to that, or listening to your staff and, and the concerns they have, the interests, etc. Um, I, I think that's a really important part of communication that that not all, especially I would say maybe junior staff have or are or terribly cognizant of. Um, and the third is the ability to collaborate with others, right? To build a network and to really be able to um, bring others along to your position, to the, the policy position that you're trying to put forward, or you know, to in, in my current role, to to get folks from around the world to participate in projects that are critical to the success of the mission uh, of the International Council of Chemical Association. So. Collaboration, networking um, is another key skill that I would have. So let me stop there. Um, I hope this was useful and look forward to your questions um, after we hear from Maggie. Very much, Sherry, except mentioning like math and needing to do statistics, that always terrifies me. Yeah. Maggie? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'm so excited to be talking to you all. It's funny, as I was listening to Sherry's list, I was like, wow, these are very much the same kind of skills that I was going to be talking about. So it seems like there might be some consistent <laughs> themes here. So I'll just lead off with the, the kind of key skills that I think have really helped me in my career thus far. And then I'll kind of trace you know, my career path up, up until today. So I think probably the three biggest things for me have been public speaking, so communication skills, Quantitative research, and Lisa, I feel you so much there because data is, is my pain point, but it's almost impossible to work and trade and, and be an effective communicator in any kind of business-oriented position without having some understanding of data and feeling comfort at, at presenting numbers in a coherent way. Um, and then networking. So, so really, I mean, WIT has been kind of like my number one networking opportunity since I started working in trade, which has been the bulk of my career. So I graduated from uh, Florida State. So I did undergrad and law school there in international affairs and political science, like probably most people who live in DC. Um, and I knew I wanted to move to DC after I graduated. I 
moved right after law school. And while I was studying or waiting to get my bar results back, I was just aggressively networking everywhere I could to try to get a job and was very lucky that I had started volunteering with WIT. So I was at a WIT event. I was handing out you know, name tags or something and I happened to be in the coffee line and I met two WIT members at the time, Peggy Clark and Gary Horlick, who are very well-known trade practitioners doing uh, AD and countervailing duty work, um, which is similar to what Sherry started out. So it seems like our careers have overlapped a little bit. So they ended up hiring me as a contract associate as soon as I got my bar results and really just helped me get my foot in the door in terms of becoming a practicing lawyer and understanding what that meant. Um, and at the same time, I'd been volunteering with WIT for quite a while. I was playing tennis with Evelyn Suarez, who was the soon to be president, and she knew um, quite a lot of people at White and Case. So she ended up sending my resume over. They were very interested in having somebody with countervailing duty experience because they were also representing a, a large Canadian company that was literally the experience I had been getting. So I was hired as an associate doing trade remedy work. Again, something that requires a lot of understanding of math and was a real learning curve for me and was a really interesting place to start my legal career because working at a global firm gives you such a broad range of visibility in terms of all of the different areas of trade that you might not realize exist. When, you know, when I was in law school, when I studied trade, it was just WTO. So it was kind of like at this level and looking at things from the federal level was so different. So I worked at White and Case, um, first in trade remedies and then moving into sanctions and export controls. So was really interested in the policy side of trade, um, sanctions and export controls. You get so much policy visibility. Um, and at the same time was working with the business and human rights interest group, which kind of crossed all the different um, pillars of what White and Case did, um, but was led by a few different trade associates around the world. So at the, I had been still active in WIT, was still very connected to my network, um, and at the time had been looking at transitioning into doing more sustainability and supply chain work. My background was in quantitative human rights, and so to me it was a really nice way to bring back my original focus of, of looking at environmental and social impact and the way that you know business kind of could facilitate those goals. So I went out on maternity leave and had been studying for a sustainability and supply chain management certificate. And I happened to tell another WIT member, Dana Stepnowski, that I had done this certificate and she was at Amazon at the time and ended up recruiting me to go in-house um, to work with her on supply chain regulatory management. So literally every trade job I've gotten in DC has been because of a WIT member <laughs> and that and that goes to show just how strong the network is because it's an incredibly collaborative group. And I think it's so important to encourage students to seek those types of groups out because to me, it was my lifeline. Like I had no connections in DC when I moved here. I really was building up a network from scratch. And so it was just like a wide open door of people who were excited to learn about my interests, offer me opportunities to prove myself and then to continue to engage me in these different ways. Um, I will also admit that my husband is at the Department of Commerce and is a trade negotiator. And he also got his first job in trade because of somebody in WIT. So like that, that connection goes both ways in our household. We are big WIT fans. Um, and so after working at Amazon throughout COVID, I just started realizing that I had kind of the, the skill set to really focus on what we call ESG, environmental, social, and governance, um, specifically within one sector. So I have a lot of connections to personal care and it's an interesting way for me to take all these really macro concepts about trade and impact that I had gotten from doing really strictly legal work and then translating it into more kind of business friendly guidance and strategic advice. So that, that kind of sums up everything that I've done. I would say that, you know, the common theme obviously throughout is this ability to find a community, really embed myself within it, and then not only seek value from it, but also seek opportunities to provide value. I think sometimes, especially when you're younger and you're starting out in your career or you've just moved into a different field, it feels like, well, I have nothing to offer. All of these incredible women have been, have been doing so much and have kind of risen to the top of their field. 
But I think seeking out opportunities to just say like, okay, well you can start volunteering or working on a newsletter, joining the board and taking note. Like there's so many opportunities just to get your foot in the door and finding groups like WIT where if you are w willing to show up and do the work, like the opportunities will will be there, I think is incredibly important. So L Lisa knows I've, I've probably raved about wit and helping my career a number of times, but it definitely has has served me and other members very well. Maggie, I think it's such a great tangible piece of advice. And I know you're going to have to leave us in a second, but maybe a quick question before you go, as you mentioned kind of that advice and networking, obviously being such a crucial part of, especially the cascade of your career, um, particularly when you're thinking about as, as with the advisors who are with us, you, do you think it would, would you recommend that it's necessary for students to actually like make the move to DC and then get started? Do you see opportunities to network from where we are any place across the country, especially yeah. these days post COVID? What, oh, what works I mean, best? Yeah, I think just finding your voice and finding the interest area that you have is really important. So when I was at FSU, you know, I felt so, Tallahassee just felt so removed from DC, but I was volunteering with the ABA's international law section because they always needed somebody to just edit the newsletter. But that got me on the phone once a month with a bunch of trade practitioners in Miami and in West Palm, but also in DC. And so from there, I just started seeing, okay, well, even before COVID, when everybody was actually doing things remotely, there are always opportunities to start learning the language of what you want to be doing. And it was also a great way to figure out what I didn't want to do. Like there were just topics from like, that I just have no interest in doing this. But being in the room with people who were doing that work through larger organizations like the ABA's different sections or with like regionally focused organizations is just the best way to start seeing what practicing in the field can look like because so many different people were, were practicing in different ways. You could be a lawyer and not be practicing law. You could be you know, a consultant or somebody who had a st stats background but doing something totally different still all within trade. So I think there, no matter where you are, now that we're all so plugged in, there are a million opportunities to just start developing a voice and like a coherent identity within trade, even before you're working, which I think is really exciting. Maggie, what I loved about what you were just saying too is um, when you said what you don't want to do, yeah. I think you really <laughs> talked about it. I mean, the more students get, the more you can try things, especially when you have so much less to risk, you know, give it a try. If it doesn't work, it's okay to walk away and say, that's, that's not where I'm going to go. I remember it's having that exact time to test the waters. Exactly. I remember having that exact conversation with friends about like, yeah, change my mind on law school. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's to work I'm law sorry, I have to leave. I know we'll be swapping speakers, but um, please feel free to forward my contact information to anybody that has any questions about anything that I discuss. You're really kind, Maggie. Thank you for doing this and a great lead in to the amazing Marjorie Chorlins. Marjorie, you know it's a really busy day, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, especially, I know you can talk to really how you've made that transition through you know, multiple, multiple career elements, especially across uh, the corporate sector. Lisa, thanks very much. And thank you to everybody for joining. I do apologize for joining late. Um, <clears throat> it's just it's just one of those days. Um, uh, Lisa mentioned multiple uh, uh, job opportunities. And so that tells you that I'm old. Um, and I've been in Washington a really long time. So um, the, the, the bad news is that I've been here a long time. The good news is that I've learned some of these lessons over and over again. Uh, and, and, you know, they finally stuck a little bit. So um, I'm happy to be here and, and spend some time talking with you all. I have to tell you the mere fact that you're interested in having this conversation uh, and the fact that you're interested in things international, it, <clears throat> it puts you, you know, head of the line as far as I'm concerned, <clears throat> because we need people who are committed to, to working on the issues that help shape our global economy. And, um, and it's great to start out when you're, when you're young thinking about these things. So <clears throat> I'll walk through a handful of lessons that I've learned over the years. Um, and then, yeah, I'm happy to, to run through my, uh, my, my career trajectory. Suffice it to say that I've worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sector, uh, sectors over the years. So happy to, happy to walk through that with you. 
Um, having joined a bit late, I'm not sure how much of this was already covered by the prior speakers. I did, I did hear uh, Maggie talk a lot about networking, which I think is an extraordinarily important skill. Um, and my message uh, for you there is simply be kind to everybody you meet because you never know when you're going to meet them again. Uh, when I was a young 20 something working at the Department of Commerce as a principal DAS for import administration, I had people who would come um, lobby me on behalf of their lawyers, who would come lobby me on behalf of their clients, who later became a um, uh, US trade representative or national security advisor, or so, you know, and those were so, so I had those relationships and I could then turn to them in, in my follow on career. Um, and uh, so very important to be, to be nice to people. Um, I think that. Uh, the, the other lesson that I just heard, which is extraordinarily important and perhaps one of the most important is um, to follow your heart, right? Um, you know, you will know for sure whether what you're doing is right for you uh, and you really shouldn't be afraid to move on from it if it doesn't feel right. You also have to be uh, willing to try hard things and potentially fail with them because that's the only way you can learn. Um, it's the only way you can test yourself and, and be, be true to yourself in that way. Don't be afraid to ask questions, right? I mean, uh, be cool with what you don't know. Um, not everybody knows everything, especially when you're earlier in your career. And it's important to ask questions. Sometimes when you ask questions, you're, you, you may be actually challenging folks with whom you're engaging to think differently. Uh, and that's actually a really healthy thing for you to bring new ideas and um, new energy into the workplace. So, so extraordinarily important. Um, I think it's also really important for you to think about what honestly motivates you. Um, you know, is it travel? Is it money? Is it title? Is it vacation time? Is it having a big corner office? You know, is it making sure that there's room for an event, for advancement in a, in a given organization? Think about what, what really matters to you. And that can involve over time, right? You're not necessarily gonna say, oh, today I, you know, it's these three things. You know, over time, over the course of your career, that will evolve. But it's really important to dig deep in yourself and think about what is it that, um, that really does matter to me. That'll help guide you on a path that you feel very, very comfortable with. Um, I think in terms of sort of basic skills, a couple of things I would highlight. Um, first, uh, writing. Uh, I, I cannot stress this enough. Um, you want to write succinctly, you want to write specifically, and you want to write for, uh, for your audience and for the context. And that, by, by that I mean, you can't necessarily put the same blob of information in front of two different people if it's in two different situations or they have two different roles or two different perspectives or trying to achieve two different outcomes. So be really careful about what you write and how you write it um, and keep it short. Short is really, really important in today's day and age when we're overwhelmed with information. Grammar is hugely important. I know it's like everybody's worst nightmare, and I know that the rules of grammar are changing. I have my own opinion about whether the Oxford comma is a good thing or not a good thing. I don't even know if everybody knows what the Oxford comma is. I don't even know if it really matters what the Oxford comma is. Um, but the key here is for you to express yourself effectively and to do it in a way, and you do that in part by demonstrating you've got good grammar and you've thought through um, how your messaging comes across. So that's that's extraordinarily important. Should you ever be forced to uh, um, uh, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, um, you have my sympathies for starters. Um, but more importantly, when you do a PowerPoint presentation, if you, I don't I hope everybody knows what PowerPoint is at this point, um, you never want to use more than four bullets on a page and you never want to read your PowerPoint presentation, right? Use the PowerPoint as a cue for you, not as a way for the page to speak to your audience. Okay, so that's that's just another little a little hint. I think, I think one of the most interesting aspects of the work that we all do, you know, all of us in our uh, careers in Washington, is is a matter of interpretation and translation. When I started out, um, I my undergraduate degree was in French. 
And I fully expected that I would be, I don't know, an interpreter or a, a translator or something like that. I love language. Um, I came to Washington to get my graduate degree and one thing led to another. And I ended up working on Capitol Hill and then the career sort of evolved from there, working on trade. And I kind of fell into trade in a way. I mean, my focus in graduate school was international economics and law, but, but trade was sort of a, you know, oh, it's a really interesting field. Turns out it was really, really interesting to me. And I didn't even know it until I found myself in that situation. What I quickly learned was, um, much to my mother's chagrin, I didn't use my uh, French language training uh, per se, although I do love to go to Paris. But more importantly, I use the concepts of translation and interpretation to, to guide how I go about advocating for, uh, for whatever cause it is I'm advocating for, right? It's important to be able to translate the ideas or the, uh, the messages that you're trying to convey in a way that people can understand in their own language, right? And so if you're trying to communicate a business concept to a government official, you may not be able to use all that jargon that you would use in government, uh, that you would use in business, or vice versa. If you're in government and you want to talk to somebody in the business community or in, in a nonprofit community or some other stakeholder community, you need to think about what's going to resonate with them. And how can you take what you think is a really easy idea and, and communicate it in a way that will really resonate with them? It's a it's challenge to do. Um, but it's also proven to be one of the most um, uh, useful skills that I have developed over time. And I hope you have um, the opportunity to do that as well. Really important for you to know whatever your material is, uh, whether you're preparing for a class, whether you're going to be doing a presentation in a meeting, whether you're going off and advocating on Capitol Hill, whatever it is you might be doing. You can be confident, though that when you're in a particular situa situation, you don't necessarily have to demonstrate that you know everything or demonstrate everything that you know, right? So here again, it's about translating and tailoring your messaging to the audience and to the, and to the context, right? You don't need to tell everybody everything you need to know about a particular subject unless you're being quizzed on it and you need to know all of the particulars and be able to demonstrate that you know all the particulars, right? So figure out what is most relevant to your audience and what are the messages you feel are really important to convey and, and, um, and trust that if more information is needed, they're gonna come back to you and you're gonna be able to supply that information from the vast storage of information you have in your head. You just don't have to put it all out there up front. Um, I guess I would say uh, for better or worse, when you are starting out in your career, um, you can't be afraid of grunt work. Um, we've all done it over the course of our careers. Some of us continue to do it from time to time because you roll up your sleeves and you do what has to be done. Um, that's sadly, it's the name of the game, right? I am now part of the reason why I'm late is that I'm in the throes of preparing briefing materials for my CEO to go off to the Munich Security Conference next week. I can't tell you how unappealing it is to think about sitting here at midnight preparing briefs for meetings um, when, you know, I really have 100,000 other things I'd rather be doing, but this is what we do. Um, again, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. You want to be respectful, but not intimidated by people in positions of authority, okay? Um, acknowledge that someone is your, your professor, your mentor, your boss, um, some high mucky muck official, don't be intimidated by them, though. Stand, stand firm in what you believe um, and find a way to communicate what you believe in a manner that is, is respectful um, of their position, but also of uh, what could be potentially a different point of view. Um, the, other, the other really important skill I think um, people often struggle with, but I think is extraordinarily important, and again, you will learn this by doing it over time, is learn to manage up. And what do I mean by that? It means trying to think about what is it your boss might need, or what is it your boss might need that he or she doesn't know she needs to, um, to actually be effective in their job, right? 
So putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and trying to, to think ahead so that they don't have to turn around and ask you and you have to go off and scramble to get whatever, whatever, right? Um, so figuring out how to manage up and thinking a step ahead of your boss, sometimes that sounds like, oh my God, that's, you know, they got the big job, why do I have to think beyond them? But, but in fact, there are things that you can do that will provide, that will make you even more, um, an even more valued uh, member of a team it, as you develop, as you develop that skill. Um, the last thing I will say, because I know I've been yammering on, is um, oh, one thing I absolutely positively have to say, because um, uh, I've, I'm an internationalist, travel, travel if you can, um, and be open to new experiences. Uh, I've been extraordinarily lucky in my career to have traveled to a number of countries, not just in Europe, but also in Asia and Africa and the Middle East. And it has been an eye-opening experience. I think it's made me a better person because I've been exposed to different cultures. Um, and I've had to learn uh, different, um, different conventions and different, um, different points of view. And that has been, that's actually made me better at what I do. Um, but it's also opened my mind in a way that I think um, sometimes it's too easy to just look inward and not and not recognize that there's a whole big world out there, right? In in business, we like to talk about the fact that 95% of the world's consumers live outside the U.S. borders, right? So there's a whole big world out there. Get out and experience it um, if if you if and when you have the opportunity. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, um, you know. If what you're doing isn't fun anymore, <laughs> um, be thinking about what is your next success and get out there and network, circling back to what, what we were talking about at the very beginning and, and what Maggie was talking about. Um, don't be afraid of a non-linear career path. I happen to have kind of a linear career path, um, you know, jumping from job to job in trade, from public sector, private sector, to association, et cetera. Um, but, but don't be afraid of a nonlinear career. If you think there's something out there that you want to do that maybe isn't, you know, directly on the trade path that you, that you think you're on, but sounds really interesting to you, it's a really cool opportunity, try that, right? I was recruited to be the number two at an organization called Business for Social Responsibility uh, out in San Francisco. Um, definitely outside my ken in one respect, um, because I was focused on international trade and business development, not so far out of the realm um, that I couldn't wrap my brain around it, but it was different and it was on a different coast and it required uprooting myself and, and moving and trying something completely different. And you know what, That was those were two of the best years of my life, I have to tell you. Um, and again, it expanded my horizons because I learned new things and, um, and then I was able actually to come back and take that knowledge and feed it back into, um, uh, back onto that, that career path. And finally, work-life balance is not, it's, it, it, it isn't a myth if you know what your priorities are. Um, and you will know that over time, hopefully sooner rather than later, so that you find that balance, um, so that you find and maintain that balance over time. Have I talked enough? I probably talked enough. I think I uh, so you did, Marjorie, as always, an absolutely phenomenal job. And I know we have a couple of questions, especially from the advisors who are encouraging students in these programs. You know, Marjorie, picking up on one of the things you were ending with there um, about getting experience and especially experience, whether it's travel or, you know, getting opportunities to work in international organizations or having that opportunity, even if they're doing it from home and remotely, mm -hmm. what advice would you have? How do how do how can we help some of the advisors who are on the call best encourage their students to look at those maybe unexpected opportunities, whether it's travel, international organizations? How do we encourage students to look at that as good exposure that's going to pay off later? Well, that's that's like the. Uh... I guess now it would be like a $64 billion question, right? Because of inflation. Um, or the debt ceiling, either way. Or the debt ceiling, right, exactly. Bumping right up on the debt ceiling there. Um, <clears throat> look, I think the only, the, the best thing to do, I think, and this is just off the top of my head. So if this is, if this is my best, you might wonder what I got, but um, 
is to get is to connect folks to others who've actually done that and let them um, through their own experiences um, sort of paint a picture for someone about for one of your uh, for one of your students about you know what this particular opportunity actually gave to them as a as a person not just in terms of you know how did it help them in school or how did it help them with their job but really how did it help them as a person um and i i just think sometimes that you know the storytelling like what we're trying to do here um is is the best way to communicate that um so yeah i think it's a great way to go about it sherry suggestions um, well, I can speak from personal experience. So before I went to, to GW for my master's degree, a friend and I traveled through Europe for six weeks with nothing but a backpack. And we had a bit of an itinerary, um, but not, we had no hotel reservations. I mean, we, we did it on the cheap. Um, so we stayed in youth hostels and our plan was, you know, reading the, the travel book and kind of taking the train to the next place that sounded interesting. Um, and I have to say that was one of the best things I ever did, right? And, and you know, what Marjorie's talked about and Maggie and I, it, most folks doing international trade work have a real appreciation for different cultures and different peoples and a love of travel and, and learning learning about other experiences, et cetera. So traveling to different parts of the world and actually being there, meeting different people, seeing how they live, eating the food, right? Driving, getting on their local transportation. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, to me, that's one of the, the, the best and most interesting parts about the world of trade and doing what we do. I mean, for me, that, that's, that's what I love, right? I mean, and, I had never even heard of places that I've been able to travel in my career. I've been to Luang Prabang in Laos. In Laos. I've, you know, I've been to Myanmar, um, just, you know, Vietnam, Russia, places that, you know, I would have never even dreamed of going, you know, prior to my, my starting this career. So I do think trying to travel um, is key, but given the, the current situation, right, because of inflation and, and all the other mm -hmm. going on, Try to at least maybe come to Washington, go to an event at there's foreign embassies are all here. They all are doing events. They're starting to to have in-person events again. Um, you know, try to get a little bit of exposure maybe that way, just to pique your interest and see if if it is really something that that you want to pursue. Um, those are just some some ideas I have. I think those are great ones. And I'm just gonna add to that too, um, because I think Marjorie, you were both alluding to a great resource. In every program, nothing motivates um, students, I don't want to call them kids, nothing motivates young people or students these days more than competing with other compatriots. Um, and a very direct example, I did study abroad, studied abroad at Sciences Po in Paris centuries ago now. Um, but while I was doing that, one of the opportunities that came through in terms of the program that was organized was you could volunteer to teach English to at a college, so an elementary school on Wednesdays. I did. None of my friends wanted to do it. There's a lot of like, why would we do that? Why would I, why would I waste my day in Paris? Um, by a month into that, most of my friends were really jealous they hadn't started because I will tell you right now, there is nothing that teaches you about the culture of a country or how to get good at a language than having six-year-olds make fun of you. <laughs> and it was phenomenal and rewarding and one of the best experiences of my life. I talked about it then and made my other colleagues jealous. I talked about it when I came back and finished senior year at GW, um, where I was part of the French program. And I know a number of other friends who did the same thing because they heard from a, a peer that that was a great way of going about it. So definitely things to think about. But I want to come back to another question that was posed, um, especially because obviously it can be they uh, we're talking about challenge uh, travels and learning other cultures and all kinds of opportunities from the perspective of a woman in this field where that's not always the best way to get through to other cultures any kind of unique experiences things that you would recommend thinking about both the challenges and the opportunities of being a woman in the international trade field sherry maybe i'll ask you first on that one um 
Well, you know, um, I would say that, you know, I have had some interesting experiences, uh, you know, traveling to, to foreign countries where, you know, women aren't always considered equal to men and, and the, the customs are, are not um, the same as, as we have here. Um, I haven't had horrible experiences. And, and I think part of that is because I was an American, right? And, and so I was maybe treated differently than a, a, a local national uh, female would have been. Um, but I think being aware of those differences, you know, before you go and, and are in that kind of a situation, um, and just always expecting to be treated with respect. And, um, you know, if you're there on a business trip to be treated professionally, if you're there studying, you're, you're a student, you and you to be treated with, with, you know, certain courtesies as such, um, you know, and never accept being treated badly or, or in an in a inappropriate <clears throat> But always just being aware of, of the differences and, and where you are and what the customs are and then the local um, traditions, I think, is, is super important. I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Um, being aware of cultural conventions is extraordinarily important. <clears throat> I mentioned, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, preparing our CEO to travel to the Munich Security Conference next week. One of the pages in the briefing book is called Cultural Conventions. Now you would think traveling to Europe, yeah, Europeans, Americans, eh, turns out that's not the case, right? Um, people in Germany have a particular sense of time and physical distance and things like that. And, and so you need to be sensitive to that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> in terms of being a woman, <clears throat> One of the things that I've found most extraordinary about working in the international trade field is that there are a lot of women who work in international trade. Um, and so that's actually pretty refreshing. And I, there was a part of me when I heard when I heard you start to post that question, I thought, well, golly, I'm, you know, it's not really it doesn't really matter whether you're a woman or man. Of course it matters. Of course it matters. Not least because women are a whole lot better at networking than guys are. They just are. So I think that creates more opportunities for you as well to um, to learn about new to to learn about new possibilities to help you think differently about a given situation, um, and to um, uh, and help help you work through problems. Um, there's a question in the chat <clears throat> in the chat. If I could just go ahead and jump jump on it, because I know we're coming up to the um, to the end of the hour. <clears throat> uh, from Lindsay running a workshop for students on how to highlight international experiences on their resumes. Um, any tips that you have about discussing international or cross-cultural experiences and how that relates to transferable skills? When I meet with people uh, who are networking and I will meet with just about anybody who wants to network with me um, because I relied on my network when I was looking for my, my next success. Um, and, and so I'm all over, you know, giving it back. Um, <clears throat> people would come to me and say, look, I'm brand new in my career. I don't really know, you know, I've done this summer job at place X or, um, yeah, I did my junior year abroad at, in country Y. Um, uh, but I don't know how to, you know, what do I do with that? That doesn't look like much on a resume. <clears throat> and what I would tell them is step back for a minute and think in sort of a, I don't know how to say this in sort of a clinical way about the skills that you've learned as a result of that experience, right? So if you've worked in a, <clears throat> in a fast food restaurant or as a server or something like that, <clears throat> what's, the one, what's one critical component that you've had, to, you've had to deal with? It's customer service. It's being aware of what, what the person in front of you wants and how you can, how you can help fulfill that need. Being attuned to what the customer wants is a huge skill in the private sector, right? Um, <clears throat> the fact that you've traveled abroad, being able to translate things like I was saying earlier, okay, you know, maybe it's not what my mother wanted using the French language, but I still translate. And you learn that capacity and you learn that openness to, to doing things differently when you've traveled abroad. So I think if you can figure out a way to break down what it is you've done, what is it, the skills you've learned along the way. Um, I mean, 
if you've taught if you've taught six year olds, um, you know, six year old French kids uh, in a classroom for and survived it, um, then you've got pretty good management skills. Um, or you've got pretty good um, you've got pretty good messaging skills because you're able to get through to these kids um, and and have them you know pay attention to you instead of just like throwing spitballs at you and things like that. So find a way to break down those skills and and present them that way. Um, I think that's that's the best advice I can give. Marjorie, it's great advice. And it's really the hallmark of this workshop too. We've talked a lot about skills and Marjorie, what you were just saying, I think is really important because this is a challenge. It doesn't matter if it's an international experience or an actual job. That's actually a problem we, for similar reasons to what Marjorie was just talking about. We all see a lot of CVs. We get a lot of resumes here in this town. And I, you see them from mid-career professionals too. And one of the challenges most of us have is we like to talk about the projects that we've done. So I do briefing materials for the CEO of the U.S. Chamber to go to the Munich Security Conference. That sounds great. That's a great project. But if you've never worked with Marjorie before, or seen anyone go to the Munich Security Conference, what does that mean? If, if I'm a stranger to you, I see that on a CD. It doesn't mean anything to me. Right. You need to talk about, uh, uh, you know, identifying the, the top three critical policy priority issues and writing briefs and key messages to communicate at the conference. Those right. now are all skills. And right. no matter what the experience is, that's really what you're trying to communicate. I know we've got like three minutes left, and this has been such a great, fascinating session. I am, go I am going to turn it back to you. you. Go ahead and make a last comment, Marjorie. I do have one last comment to offer, and then I, unfortunately, I do have to run. Um, <clears throat> when I'm interviewing people, <clears throat> one question that I ask that always trips people up, actually, Lisa, you'll find this funny, I think, is how would you explain what you do to a six-year-old, right? You dealt with six-year-olds in France, so. but how would you explain what you do to a six-year-old? And it's so interesting to see those who will rely on the jargon of, you know, their adult self and an adult perspective to communicate versus those who actually figure out how to break down what it is they do into something that a little kid can understand, right? It's, it's a tough, it's tougher than you think it is. Um, especially for those of us who, who aren't around a lot of little kids these days. Um, but it's it's something to think about. How can you communicate to somebody who has no clue what it is you do? To this day, my parents still don't understand what I do. So that tells you that I'm not very good at explaining it, but that's what I got. Well, part of that too is a different reference point. My mother is thrilled with what I do when I get to call her up and say, I'm going to the French embassy tonight for a reception. There you now go. she finds my job interesting. Still right. doesn't know what I do. Right. Sherry, I'm going to let you have a last word too. Um, I gotta just, run. Thanks, Marjorie. Marjorie. So just building off of the, the recent comments about a CV and, and you know, what's important on your resume. So I would just add when I'm looking at resumes and I've looked at a, a lot of them over the years, you know, I, I look for accomplishments in a job, not just what my role was, but what, what were your successes in that job? And an important tip that I got that that you know wasn't all that long ago. I the resume should really project who you want to be or, or what job you're looking to get, right? Or, or where you want your career to go. So I would encourage students looking for their first job to highlight skills or accomplishments that will position them for a role that they are looking for, not necessarily what, what they've already done. What are you looking to do? So that's some good advice that I got that, that I would pass on. And I think that is the best way to end. I know we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, this is not a one and done conversation. We're happy to follow up with anybody. We're thrilled to get to partner with you guys. And Carmen, I can't thank you enough for creating the opportunity. Well, thanks to Lisa and Cherry and, and Maggie and Marjorie for all of their insights. And I love uh, the two easy takeaway workshops. One is our, your students have to translate what they do to each other like they were six-year-olds. And the other one is, is a great resume review technique about projecting skills rather than just a laundry list of, of accomplishments. So hopefully that and all of the other great insights are of use to all of you as you go back to your advising offices and, and help to shape your students' thinking 
We at APSI are always here to be of service in that regard and in so many others. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Brittany and thank you to all of our attendees. We look forward to seeing you at the next APSIA PISA workshop. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks a lot.